Leonardo of Pisa, better known by the name Leonardo Fibonacci, lived roughly from 1170 to 1240 and is considered to be the first important European mathematician. On journeys to Africa, Byzantium and Syria, he came into contact with Arabic mathematics, which in the Christian Occident was largely unknown. In his work, Liber Abaci, the Book of the Abacus, which was published in 1202, he combined this knowledge with his own reflections. The book long remained unexcelled in the history of Occidental mathematics and contributed to, among other things, Europe adopting the Arabic system of numbers. Liber Abaci contains a thought experiment which Fibonacci himself probably regarded as pure curiosity and did not pursue further, but which later was to become famous as the Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci asked himself how many pairs of rabbits originated from a single pair in one year. To do this, he assumed that none of the rabbits would die in the course of that year, and that each pair of rabbits would produce exactly one more pair of both sexes per month, which in turn would be fertile from the second month after birth. In his book Liberabaci, he writes, because the above-mentioned pair gives birth in the first month, you can double it. So there are two pairs after one month. So at the end of the first month, and it is here that Fibonacci begins counting, there exist two pairs of rabbits. At the end of the second month, the original pair has given birth to another pair, and the other pair became fertile. Now there are three pairs. Of these three pairs, two in the third month are now fertile, and one is not yet fertile. Thus, at the end of the next month, two more pairs of rabbits are added. So now there exist altogether five pairs. Of these five pairs, three in turn become pregnant, so that in the fourth month there are eight pairs. To find out how many pairs of rabbits there are, Fibonacci observed, all you have to do is in each case to add up the sum of the pairs of rabbits of the two previous months. To begin with, there is one pair of rabbits. After one month, there are two pairs. After two months, there is one plus two, or three pairs. After three months, two plus three, or five, after four months, three plus five, or eight, and so on. Until, after eleven months, 233 pairs of rabbits have resulted from the first pair. And Fibonacci writes, when finally the 144 pairs are added to those born in the last month, in the end, there are 377 pairs. And the above-mentioned pair have finally produced that many pairs at the end of one year. Although Fibonacci's thought experiment is based, of course, on unrealistic assumptions, it does describe the essential features of growth processes. While for Fibonacci his problem was thus solved, it was later discovered that the Fibonacci sequence also occurs in nature and in art, be it in the position of leaves and plants, in the spiral form of mollusks, in the structure of clouds in an area of low pressure, and in paintings, the architecture of buildings, and in music. It is also possible to approach the Fibonacci numbers geometrically. Let us assume a square whose sides measure one. Beside it, we construct a second square of the same size. We attach another square to it, which has the length two. To this is added a square with the length of the side 3, one with the length of the side 5, one with the length of the side 8. 
it is not difficult to recognize the numbers of the Fibonacci sequence. Now we draw a quadrant in each square. The result is a spiral called the Fibonacci spiral. It can be clearly seen in the shell of the Nautilus. To better understand the role of the Fibonacci series and organic geometry in the world around us, we met with Michael Schneider, author of A Beginner's Guide to Constructing the Universe. Michael demonstrates the dynamic presence of the Fibonacci sequence in the living, growing world. Well, the Fibonacci numbers refers to a sequence of numbers that grow by continual expansion, but a very special, balanced growth expansion and the mathematical definition of them really is an archetypal pattern starts off with the numbers zero and one zero sort of acts like a seed in a sense zero and one and the rule is that each next term is the sum of the two previous terms so zero plus one make one one plus one make two one plus two make three two and three make five three and five make eight 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, 233, and endless. But it's an expansive pattern that shows organic growth patterns that occur all through nature. The invisible Fibonacci spiral shows itself in the visible world in the nautilus shell, the sunflower, and the branching of trees. This mathematical sequence charts nature's progress of organic spiraling growth through self-accumulation. The appearance of this sequence, embodied by the Fibonacci spiral or golden spiral in plants, animals, or solar systems, tells us that the Fibonacci sequence and phi ratio underlie an internal harmony, excellence, and dynamic balance during the inevitable growth and dissolution processes. It is the play of life itself, clothed in the four states of matter. These characteristics are the open secret of balance of animal horns, seashells, plants, and galaxies, for example, as the chambered nautilus creature grows larger, the gland that exudes shell material also grows, building a widening shell. The shell's golden spiral shape maintains the same center of gravity at any size, so the nautilus need not learn how to balance itself as it matures. The same is true for the growing horns of a ram. As the horn material accumulates, growing larger and more massive, its golden spiral shape maintains the same center of gravity. Thus, the ram need not adjust its posture throughout life to uphold its growing horns. Similarly, the tree that puts out branches and leaves and spiral staircases up and around their respective trunks can get enormously large, yet the tree always balances, no matter how massive and complex it grows to be. And so any kind of organic expansion will benefit from this kind of growth that incorporates balance, physical balance, uh, it will pack the most seeds in the least space. Um, and whenever you find these Fibonacci numbers, you also find spirals. And the benefit of the spiral is, of course, organic, expansive growth in a, in, in a kind of a fashion that will also maximize uh, all the benefits of the seed properties and so forth. The way they show up in the uh, plant world, the plant world is rife with these numbers. Uh, for example, in this artichoke flower, I will simply, let's see, I'll draw a, uh, a mark so we know where we started on this, and I'll count this row of petals as one row. And what I'm going to do is count the numbers of parallel rows of petals. So there's one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then back to the beginning. So there are eight rows leaning in this direction. But each petal plays a role in two directions. So I can also think of these as spiraling this way. And if I count the numbers of parallel rows here, if we'll count that as one, two, three, four, five, 
and back to the beginning. So there are eight in this direction, five in that direction. That's what you find throughout nature. Two consecutive Fibonacci numbers uh, composing the same structure. And what this does, what this number pattern does, is it gives perfect balance to the structure as it's growing. Not as a static structure, but these Fibonacci numbers and the spiral, the logarithmic organic spiral that occurs with them, uh, balances through growth, transformation, expansion. And that's the beauty of this. It's balanced through growth and change through these numbers. It's an organic expansion from that, you might say, zero seed to as large as you like, but it's always going to have a self-resembling property. It's the closest, the, the, the logarithmic spiral is the closest definition you can get to a definition of life. It was the Greek mathematician Euclid who around 300 BC produced the first precise description of the golden section. He called it division according to the outer and middle proportion. A length is divided into two parts in such a way that the smaller part is to the larger part in the same proportion as the larger one is to the whole. Later, in the 15th century, the Italian mathematician and Franciscan monk Luca Pacioli took an interest in Euclid's works and devoted a whole volume to this division of lines, which he called Divina Proporzione, or Divine Partition. Around 1600, Johannes Kepler, known for the Kepler laws of the movements of planets, discovered the relationship between the Fibonacci numbers and the golden section. He observed that the relationship between a number in the Fibonacci sequence and the previous number more and more closely approaches the irrational number phi the longer the sequence is continued. And phi describes nothing other than the golden section. The golden section defines a proportion which has always been perceived as especially beautiful and harmonious. In many epics we find its application in almost all cultures throughout the world, above all in architecture and art. A rectangle, in which the proportions of its sides correspond to the golden section, is called a golden rectangle. Similarly, isosceles triangles, in which two sides are in this proportion, are termed golden triangles. An important part is also played by the so-called golden angle, psi, which divides the angle of 360 degrees in the proportions of the golden section. As angles smaller than 180 degrees prove to be more handy in practice, the smaller of the resultant angles is usually called the golden angle, psi. It is approximately 137.5 degrees. The pentagram is a regular five-pointed star which is formed by the diagonals of a regular pentagon and which has been considered to be a magic sign since antiquity. The golden section appears here in an especially impressive way, as it can be found geometrically in the pentagram several times. For each line and partial line, there is a partner, which, together with it, is in proportion to the golden section. The pentagram 
can also be imagined as a composition of five golden triangles. If the five intersections are connected inside it, another pentagram is created there. Even when a pentagram is again drawn in its interpentagon and so on, all the triangles contained in this drawing are golden triangles. If an apple is cut through the middle, it is found to contain a natural depiction of the pentagram in its core. Like all members of the rose family, the apple is assigned to the female, the life-giving principle. It is thus not surprising that the pentagram is the symbol of Venus, both of the planet and the goddess. As the symbol can be drawn in an unbroken line, and at the end comes back to the beginning, it was also a sign for the cycle of life. In the Middle Ages, the pentagram, or pentacle, was used as a figure to ward off demons. And even today, it is omnipresent. The stars of numerous flags, for example, those of the USA or the EU, are all pentagrams. The symbol of Islam or the Soviet star are also pentagrams. What is surprising is the frequent occurrence of the golden section and the Fibonacci numbers in nature. These structural principles reappear most conspicuously in the phyllotaxis of plants, i.e. in the arrangement of their leaves and seed cases. In many of the more highly developed species of plants, the angle between spirally shaped consecutive leaves is on average about 137.5 degrees, the golden angle. This arrangement of leaves is also termed the Fibonacci phyllotaxis. As the golden angle is based on an irrational number, one leaf will never lie exactly over another. The sunlight coming from above can thus be used to the best advantage and the maximum quantity of rain that falls is passed on to the roots. In the case of the sunflower, Philotaxis appears in the spirally arranged seed cases on the flower's receptacle in an especially aesthetic form. The clearly recognizable Fibonacci spirals are not formed from seeds which follow one another in the course of growth, but rather they result as a consequence of the fact that consecutive seeds are arranged at intervals. Here, the deviation from the mathematical golden angle is less than 0.01%. If we consider the number of arcs which turn counterclockwise and clockwise, it will hardly be a surprise. Here too, we have consecutive Fibonacci numbers. In the outer area of sunflowers, there are usually 34 and 55 spirals. In the case of larger specimens, 55 and 89, or even 89 and 144. Whether the larger number of arcs turn clockwise or counterclockwise, however, is left to chance. This animation shows a constructed inflorescence with 200 seeds. Moving from the center of germination, the seeds push outwards as growth progresses until the whole receptacle is filled out. Seeds that follow one another emerge precisely around the golden angle, separately from one another, as this ensures that the seeds are packed together in the most compact way.
This, however, becomes clear if the angle between two consecutive seeds that follow one another in the course of growth is changed. As we can see here, 13 and 21 Fibonacci spirals emerge. From time immemorial, wherever people wanted to express beauty and where they tried to approach the divine ideal, we come across the golden proportion. Generally in art, and in architecture, and in particular, at holy sites. Even in the pyramids of Giza, the proportions of the number phi are revealed with astounding accuracy. Thus, for example, in the case of the Cheops pyramid, the proportion of the length of the side of the pyramid to half of the pyramid's base is 356 to 220 L's and that corresponds to 1.618 of the number phi. Also, in the most famous stone monument, Stonehenge, which was built near Salisbury, England some 3,500 years ago, we again find the golden measurements. The Parthenon Erected in Athens under Pericles around 450 BC is one of the best-known classical buildings. At the same time, it is regarded as the most beautiful and most accomplished work of ancient Greek architecture. The proportions of the golden section are built into it in many ways and with surprising precision. From 1940, the architect and painter Le Corbusier developed a uniform measuring tool which replaces the metric system with a scale of harmonious dimensions derived from the proportions of the human body and the golden section. In his book The Modular, in which he published these ideas, and which today is one of the most significant works of architectural theory, he writes, a person with a raised arm provides in the main points where space is displaced foot, solar plexus, head, fingertips of the raised arm, three intervals which result in a series of golden sections named after Fibonacci. In art, the proportions of the golden section appear in the basic structure of numerous well-known paintings, such as The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci, or this self-portrait by Albrecht Dürer. An artist of modern times who conspicuously employs the golden section is, for example, the Dutch painter, Piet Mondrian. In the concourse of Zurich's main station, there is also an example of a contemporary use of the Fibonacci numbers in the fine arts. The installation Ovus Philosophicus by the Italian artist Mario Merz. In music, the golden section occurs in several forms. Let us take a look at a piano keyboard. The interval of an octave from C to C1 comprises eight white, and five black keys. Together, 13 keys. The black keys are divided up into groups of two and three. 
all numbers and proportions from the Fibonacci series. In the writings of the musicologist Anno Lentfei, we read that the golden section and the Fibonacci numbers reappear in the works of the composer Bela Bartok as the dominant principle of composition. This becomes especially obvious in the sonata for two pianos and percussion, where not only the parts of the form follow the proportions of the golden section, Bartok himself, whose favorite flower is said to have been the sunflower, has, however, never made mention of this. Similar investigations have also been made into the works of Bach, Mozart, Schubert, Debussy, and Satie. Last but not least, the golden section is also to be found in the construction of musical instruments. In the New Oxford Companion to Music, Volume 2, you can read that Stradivari and Guarneri used the golden section in order, for example, to place the sound holes in their world-famous instruments at exactly the desired position. The American-French mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot is very largely responsible for the interest in fractal geometry and the chaos theory that emerged in the 1980s. Fractals are firstly only mathematically defined objects which are not one, two, or three-dimensional, but something in between. It is impossible to imagine that clearly. Nevertheless, Objects occur in nature which come close to such fractals. Structures can be found in them that repeat themselves and which are similar when considered approximately or in detail. That is why we also talk of self-similarity. An especially beautiful example of fractal geometry in nature is the Romanesco, a green variety of cauliflower. But it was not so much the scientific significance as the possibility of producing pictures of great aesthetic appeal using simple algorithms and the computer that no doubt contributed to the popularity of fractals. The most famous of them is probably the Mandelbrot set. In it, similar but repeatedly new and incredibly beautiful structures are revealed in the area of their edges with every enlargement. What do fractals have to do with the Fibonacci numbers? The apple shapes of the Mandelbrot set, which vary in size, arise in different periods of the repetition of mathematical algorithms. If we examine these apple shapes, we make the following observation. Of all the apples between one apple of period 2 and one apple of period 3, it is the apple of period 5 that is the largest. In exactly the same way, of all the apples between period 5 and period 3, it is the apple of period 8 that is the largest. And of the apples between that of period 8 and that of period 5, it is the apple of period 13. All numbers from the Fibonacci series. In the late 1920s, the American mathematician Ralph Nelson Elliott developed an analysis of the equity market, which was later called the Elliott Wave Principle. Elliott examined, in particular, the psychological aspects of the seller's behavior and tried to explain movements in the market by means of patterns in crowd psychology. His wave theory claims that share prices are guided by predetermined cycles based on the Fibonacci sequence. According to that, during a bull market, the market prices move in five upward waves and in three waves somewhat downwards again. In a bear market, the pattern is reversed. 
If the Elliott waves are examined from the perspective of the chaos theory, different intervals can be interpreted as self-similar. The waves, five up, three down, occur not just after quite a considerable time, but every day, every hour, every minute. Recent research has shown that such models, so-called market fractals, may be interpreted as instruments for measuring the social and historical development of a country.